Alex, you know, we've asked this question of almost all the people we've had on the show. Do you remember the first time you went climbing? So I don't technically remember the first time I climbed in a gym. I mostly remember the photos of me as a five-year-old climbing at the, the Rocknasium, this climbing gym that opened uh, near my home. But I went there once, I believe, on one of my sister's field trips or something random through school. And basically, I enjoyed it enough that when a climbing gym opened in Sacramento in my hometown, uh, my parents took me because they knew that I liked it from the one time that I'd been. My father would take my sister and I and... Uh, and bring snacks, you know, basically like make a day of it. Cause if we're going to pay day use and we're going to be there, you know, we're going to like be there for the afternoon and hang out, have a good time. And so, you know, we'd have like a candy bar and some sandwiches and we'd all be at the gym for the afternoon, like having this excursion. Do you view indoor climbing differently than you do climbing outdoors? I mean, I love going to the climbing gym. I love climbing. And in a lot of ways, the climbing gym is the most distilled and, and sort of simplest version of climbing. You get all the joy of the movement with none of the hassle of equipment and worrying about safety and evaluating risk and dealing with weather conditions and all those kinds of things. Um, it's interesting. You know, I think if you've gotten into the sport, even in like the last 15 years, uh, it's it's kind of hard to understand like that the first wave of gyms, they were like pretty, eh, you know, like. They, they, were, they had their flavor, right? You know, going into a climbing gym 30 years ago felt dingy for the most part. I mean, most gyms were sort of tight, dark, you know, poorly lit and just dirty. You know, they smell bad. They smell like the rental shoes that there'd be chalk dust in the air, sort of like hard to breathe, hard to see, you know, everything a little more cramped, like things not quite up to code, you know, all just like a little gross for the most part. And then nowadays, you go into some of the brand new, well-built gyms. Like, for, for example, I went into a brand new gym in uh, Austin, Texas, and I walked in. It was like this enormous, spacious lobby, everything super clean and white with tons of you know fresh air and, and natural light coming in. And I was like, I swear that a robot is going to serve me some life extending smoothie right now. You know, I was like, this is like a futuristic health spa. I was like, where am I? You know, there are people in like co-working spaces above the lobby, like working on their computers and, you know, writing code or something. And I was like, this is totally a health spa from like, you know, 2175 on Mars or something. I was like, where am I? Like, this is totally outrageous. Do you, do you miss the old gyms? No, no, I freaking love new gyms. <laughs> I think old gyms, I mean, old gyms, you know, are charming and quaint in their in their way, but they're just not as fun. It's like, I, I like well-lit, you know, open, clean spaces. Like, I love new modern gyms. You know, pre-COVID, like, I remember being at my local gym and one of my friends, he's got to do a work call with investors or clients or something, but it's like a, a serious phone call and he just goes upstairs, stops climbing, goes upstairs to this like private booth, you know, does his call comes back, finishes the session, we grab a beer downstairs. And I sort of had this like eureka moment that this has just changed so much. Like there's no way 20 years ago you would have taken a phone call like with an investor or something like that. There would have been like Megadeth or Metallica like Dude. <laughs> cranked up to like 11 <laughs> on the speakers. That That is that's so true. It's funny. Uh, anytime I hear Megadeth, it makes me think of my old gym. I'm like, yeah, raging. <laughs> it's like, it's so funny. Or like the band Creed, heavy rock from back in the day. It's just, it's so classic. I feel like I've heard you tell some um, pretty epic stories about riding your bike uh, through Sacramento to get to the to your local climbing gym. So I don't know exactly what age I was when I started biking to the climbing gym more on my own. I think I kind of eased into it. So probably at, you know, 12, 13, 14, I probably started going, a, you know, a few times a week by myself. And then as I got older, you know, 16, 17, I was going to the gym, you know, four or five days a week by myself on the bike. Uh, it was a seven and a half mile bike ride each way across the suburbs. So it was like a 15 mile round trip. But what made the whole thing super exciting was that I never had a light on my bicycle or anything like that. So I'd be biking home from the gym at close, so like at 10 p.m., and I'd be biking along the green belt. And, you know, occasionally you'd see deer run. For, you know, basically it was just so dark and there are trees and the bike path is all overhung by trees. And so there are mountain lions out there. And I was always worried that I was going to eat by a mountain lion because there had been reports of runners getting attacked on the bike path. And, you know, being like a teenager or like a 13 year old biking by myself in the dark with no lights, I was always like, are there eyes behind me? <laughs> like, is that a mountain lion? Am I about to get taken down from behind? I was like, always biking pretty freaking fast. 
I once just went straight head to head into another biker. We were both like, Oh my God, never saw each other at all. Uh, you know, pretty, pretty scrappy stuff for like a teenager on the bike path by himself every night. But it was, uh, it was cool though. I mean, it was a good way for me to be, you know, independent as, as a teenager. And also actually one of my favorite things about my whole biking situation in Sacramento with the climbing gym was that uh, actually my grandparents' house was made like a perfect triangle to go back to my own home. So I could make this like, you know, one leg to the gym, go from the leg to my grandparents, then from my grandparents back to my house. And I made this like perfect triangle across Sacramento. And so I could always go get snacks and like have a nice time and have a scenic bike ride along the river. It was, I don't know. I mean, it was a pretty idyllic way to, to grow up going to the gym. In a way, does it, does a gym kind of feel like home to you? Yeah, there is. There is definitely a feeling of comfort and home to any gym that I go to anywhere in the world. And it's interesting because even in other countries, when I show up in a climbing gym, I feel totally comfortable taking off my shoes and socks, wandering around barefoot, you know, dumping my stuff wherever I want and basically having a session climbing. And it's it's remarkable how comfortable that feels for me. I mean, I guess, you know, 30 years of doing something consistently starts to feel pretty normal. But uh, I mean, climbing just anywhere you go, you're like, oh, it's time to climb. I mean, especially for me on the free solo tour, that was probably the most grounding element of of my life at that point. You know, it's like when you're living in in hotels and you know airports and just going from event to event. Anytime you drop into a climbing gym, you're like, at least this is constant. You know, because every gym is is at the heart the same experience. You know, basically you're going there to climb, and so you're always going to have roughly the same experience at any climbing gym in the world. More and more. It feels like the climbing gym is becoming an extension of our homes. We climb there, we socialize there, we work there, we hang out. There's a lot of positives to these new gyms and the growth of the sport, but there are also a ton of questions moving forward. As gyms become a global crag of sorts, what do we want this to become? How do we keep welcoming people in? Does this become a country club or the mechanism for broadening our community and unleashing a new wave of talent into climbing. Today on Chapter 7, we talked to Malik Martin and John Hawk about an incredible climbing project happening in the heart of a city. We take you to Memphis Rocks, a one-of-a-kind climbing gym. We get some help from Conrad Anker. I'm Fitz Hall. I'm Alex Honnold. This is Climbing Gold. Chapter seven. This place will change climbing. Was uh, the national championships just held in Memphis? Yes, yes, it was. I was pretty close to almost getting on a commentating panel. They weren't ready for. Oh it. yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is Malik Martin. <laughs> yeah, they were. Maybe ne- <laughs> next year, next year, you fight your way in. Hey, I might be at the World Cup commentating. I mean, I think it'll. I, having like three experts talk about it is cool, but I think two experts and one idiot will be even better. Because I'll not, just not, be not like... A, <laughs> not an idiot, but somebody who's uh, sufficiently impressed by the climbing. You can be the guy there being like, go. holy shit, did you see what he just did? And that's you what know, I was like, doing, bro. Everybody was quiet. And like, I would be like... I was like, that wasn't good or some shit? And they'd be like, yeah. I'm like, so when can we clap? Is it like golf? Because I didn't want to be the loud black dude, but I mean, hell, fuck it. Like, are we just going to sit here and not be amazed? This is fucking nationals. I was like, yo, let's go! Let's go! <laughs> My name is Malik Martin. I'm from South Memphis, Tennessee. Grew up two minute walking distance away from the gym. That's my hood, my stomping grounds. The gym is located in South Memphis in the neighborhood of Soulsville. I of the poorest zip codes in America, 38106. And the, the thing about Memphis is it's a diverse city, but it's one of the most segregated cities in America. After the death of Martin Luther King, white flight, all the white people moved into the suburbs surrounding Memphis. But Memphis Rocks is, you know, in an underserved community on purpose. I'm a photojournalist. That's what brought me to the gym. We were coming to do a story on the gym and I didn't know what the place was. So when I first walked in, I felt like I was walking into like Narnia. The wow factor of typically things of that nature 
do not come into the neighborhood and if they do come to the neighborhood they're not accessible for like the vast majority of the people who live there and occupy that space so i came there for the story and that's all i was there for was the story and once the story was over i never climbed before and chris was like you know do you want to climb Chris Dean is a community outreach leader for Memphis Rocks. Good afternoon. Here's Chris at his high school graduation in 2011. Introduce the keynote speaker. Our keynote speaker's position make this a difficult job for me. Under normal circumstances, the person who introduces the keynote speaker usually have to give vital statistics about the speaker that no one knows, like where he works. <laughs> Everyone knows that or to whom he's married to. Everyone knows the beautiful First Lady Michelle Obama. Or what the speaker was born. <laughs> but that was a joke. Aside from being able to verbally dunk on a sitting president, Chris would go on to help found Memphis Rocks. Chris grew up in Soulsville, and when the time came to open the doors, part of Chris's job was to get the community engaged with the state-of-the-art climbing gym that had just landed in the heart of the neighborhood. So Chris asked Malik if he wanted to try climbing. And I was, you know, I was like, yeah, sure. I'll try anything once. And I climbed, you know, it was the top, top rope wall. You know, I was shaking and sweating, but I, I finished it. I sent it, you know, I flashed it. I do believe, <laughs> you know, it was just, it was like a five, six, you know, I showed it who's boss and shit, you know, but, um, from there I was a freelance photojournalist. So, so being a freelancer means that, you have a lot of time on your hands. So the gym was like, we don't open for two more weeks. You can come and climb before we open. And I would just come in there for like a week and I was just bouldering, you know? And then one day John Hawk was just like, yo, you want a job? And I was like, yeah, cause I'm a journalist and I make $15 a photo. <laughs> <laughs> Hell yeah. I want a job. There's definitely an impression when people hear that we're a nonprofit climbing gym they think it's probably just some like home wall woody with like, you know, holds from the 90s. But we are a 37,000 square foot climbing facility. My name's John Hawk. I'm the director of operations here at Memphis Rocks. Been here since the construction phase in 2017, but um, I've also been climbing and working in the industry since 2004. The first thing you see is artwork in our hallway. This building was supposed to be a grocery store. Nobody moved in. And you know, every grocery store, or at least big chain grocery store you go to, they have those big hallways, right, for the carts. There's a, an amazing mural of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. There's two community art projects that we have in that hallway. And then you get to the front desk and you see employees that you don't ever see at other climbing gyms. And then you see like the bouldering area. Then you see our rope area, 100 rope lanes, 48 feet tall. Then you've got this very open, really cool fitness and climbing training area on the mezzanine. Before opening, the founder and uh, Chris Dean and other comrades knocked on doors in the community to ask what people needed. And um, you know, the e ethos of the gym is that we don't ever want anyone to be turned away um, because their inability to pay. We're an access point to relationships. And from those relationships, we figure out how we can serve that person or that community or that family in the best way possible while having a lot of fun, like rock climbing and joking around and, and heckling each other. Also, it stands as a hub for community outreach and output. We have mental health clinic coming on campus. We have a community closet where you can come get a jacket, shirt, shoes, and toilet tissue and communal, you know, household items. Everything's under $5. Some people only come for the clothing closet and that's okay. We have a few people who come to climb, you know, that's okay too. I would say it's the hardest thing that I've ever done because there's no blueprint for this model, right? Like we created it. After the break, Malik asks us to imagine a different perspective. And we get Alex's take on 90s comedies and his true feelings about pets. The 
over 50% of our staff can walk to work and they live in the neighborhood that Memphis Rocks resides in. And that was intentional, you know, like intentionally hiring people from the neighborhood instead of, you know, hiring the more seasoned people who've been in the industry longer or know more about climbing. Memphis Rocks took people who didn't know anything about climbing, trained them vigorously, taught them ropes, taught them, you know, gear. And so how did that come to be? Like, why, why is that the mission of Memphis Rocks? It came to be from our founder, Tom Shadiak. That was his vision. That's what he wanted to bring. Alex, are you old enough to remember the Jim Carrey film, Ace Ventura, Pet Detective? I think uh, I think my brain has scrubbed Ace Ventura, Pet Detective from its memory, which is probably for the best. <laughs> um, anyway, yeah, don't know anything about Ace Ventura and, and don't really care about pet. I, I don't even like pets that much, let alone <laughs> comedy movies about pets. So that film... As weird and strange as it was, uh, would launch Jim Carrey into international superstardom. Uh, it would gross more than $100 million worldwide at the box office, and a guy named Tom Shadiak wrote and directed it. And Tom would go on to make a series of box office smash comedies with Jim Carrey, but also with like Eddie Murphy and Robin Williams. And from the 90s into the 2000s, he's pumping out these blockbuster comedies, In 2007, Tom had a bad mountain biking crash and sustained a bad concussion and spent several months struggling with serious complications from the head trauma. During the healing process, he completely rethinks his life, materialism, happiness, all of that. And he ends up abandoning the Hollywood lifestyle, the private jet that he owns, the Malibu mansion. He made a documentary about it called I Am. And through that documentary, you see his transformation as like, you know, understanding how much help and how far money can truly go. After Hollywood, Tom started teaching at colleges and universities. Along the way, he got interested in climbing. He ended up in Memphis teaching storytelling at Lemoyne Owen College, an HBCU in Soulsville. Memphis didn't have a climbing gym. Decades earlier, Tom's father had raised the money to build St. Jude's Children's Hospital in Memphis, which offers free care to sick children, and it made an impact on Tom growing up. Now, he had an idea for the climbing gym as a community center. Tom started talking to local community leaders. He connected with Chris Dean, who years earlier caught everyone's attention with his introduction of Obama at the Booker T. Washington High School graduation. Today means that someone who looks like me can go to Columbia and Harvard and become the president of the United States of America. The Obama commencement speech was a moment for Chris. People remembered his words that day. I'll speak of presidents means to me, growing up in a home without a father figure will not stop me from being an iconic father figure in the eyes of my children. And he becomes this community leader. Chris would go on to intern at the White House. Uh, The Obama Foundation would offer him a job that he would turn down so he could stay in Memphis to work in the community. Chris told Tom he needed to start asking questions and listening. Soulsville didn't need saving. It needed to be heard. It needed to be seen by those outside the community. It needed to be invested in. It needed safe, healthy spaces. In 2018, Memphis Rocks opened its doors to two communities who shared the same city and maybe not much else, the Soulsville community and the Memphis climbing community. In a deeply diverse but segregated city, it began pulling people from different walks of life into the same building around the same sport. There were different ways to contribute. Standard climbing gym memberships were one way, but there was also mentorship and volunteering, which you could trade for access to the gym. One of those breakthroughs that he had was like, currency shouldn't just be money, right? Like reimagining currency, energy is also currency. So why does everything have to be paid for with money when you can volunteer your time and help and and earn in that manner? I mean, anybody with money can build some climbing walls and call it a climbing gym, right? But it takes the people that work there and also the people that climb there to make it an actual community. Before Memphis Rocks, if you would ask me, would I ever rock climb or would I ever climb a mountain? And I'm like, why would I do that? I'm black. If I want to like, feel an adrenaline rush i'll just go stand in front of like the corner store all day or i'll just drive to the grocery store without my license you know what i'm saying like i'll just do something that's menial to many people but as a black man under an oppressive society can like 
it's very can be very scary. You know what I mean? Like I'll go walk around a white neighborhood at a gingerly pace. If I really want to risk my life, I don't have to climb a mountain. You know, at least classically, kind of the point of a climbing gym is to is for people to gain the skills to be competent climbers and, and you know, seek out those those challenges, those adventures outdoors. You know, is there a component of that to Memphis Rocks or, you know, how, how does that fit into the, the vision of Memphis Rocks? Memphis Rocks prepared me by like just having the infrastructure for me to train. You know, just to be able to, like, get ready to go outside. But nothing can get you ready for outside, but outside. <clears throat> when I first went to Color the Crab, it was my first time going outside to Boulder. And when we got there, I was like, oh, it's a big-ass rock. This is, they climb rocks. Okay. You know, where it's not colored route holds dotted upside the wall. It's, just, you know, look at chalk marks and indentions in the rock. That's where you go. And um, being slowly indoctrinized into the outdoors i think is important for you know me to go be able to be like oh this is rock climbing and then to go from there and you know climb a mountain like the biggest mountain i've done is the grand uh me and conrad hiked to the saddle and then did the grand and then hiked out we summoned and hiked out the next day alex will you introduce conrad the legend the philanthropist the man himself i don't know how you introduce conrad anchor the connection we get when we tie in with someone is um that all of a sudden you're like, oh, okay, we're we're having fun, but we're going to have a whole lot of fun with the potential of getting hurt or dying. And because of that, we have to be heads up and we have to do the right thing. We have to trust each other. And that connection as humans is unique. And that's what makes climbing the thing that it is. And <laughs> why I want to get out and go today. <laughs> Conrad first met Malik when he took a trip to visit Memphis Rocks for an event. Malik was taking photos. Yeah, Malik is, he is top drawer. And we just met and we're like, oh, you're the photographer? Great. I'm Conrad. Let's have some fun. And so. Conrad showed him how to rig to photograph climbing. The friendship continued. Malik and Christine and a crew from Memphis Rocks would come out to Bozeman to learn to ice climb with Conrad. Malik would step behind the camera to film the experience. The result was Black Ice, which headlined last year's Real Rock Tour, and I think it's about to relaunch right now if you haven't caught it already. That film, it's made Malik pretty recognizable in the climbing community. We became friends, and so we maintained our friendship and connection, and Malik came up in sort of the last two weeks of June and the first part of July last year and spent three weeks with our family and our boys. He's the same age as, as Max, um, our oldest boy and you know, Sam and Isaac. So there, it was good for them to, to hang out. And we all went and climbed Granite Peak and the Grand Teton and, and we got to see his humor. Having Malik at our house was special. And also for me made it like, like this is what privilege is. This is what systemic racism it's super obvious and yeah i look at the family that jenny and i have created the alex lowe's three sons and the opportunities they have just by birth are so much different than what malik has has and to to see that and to understand that is is meaningful you know for me to get to the summit of that mountain cannot compare to the things that i've had to overcome in my personal life and the mountain is just another like another avenue or expressive outlet for my creativity to pour out of me being a survivor. So what did you have to overcome in your neighborhood? Um, I mean, poverty and hopelessness. And I'll try to paint this picture. I want you to understand if you wake up, your parents are absent, both of them, for wherever it may be like legal problems or drug issues or they're working all the time and they're not, you know, very, you know, productive uh, in their child's day to day life. You have no resources or food and like overcoming that day to day, like figuring out how you're going to maneuver, what you're going to do. Um, sometimes a good day is just I want to eat today. You know what I'm saying? Other times it's like, you know, school's coming back. I'd like to eat and get some new shoes. Economic hardship, because where there is extreme poverty and hopelessness, there's crime. Because if there's people who feel like they have no avenues, no resources, no choices, and nothing's ever going to change, 
but you're still hungry. You still have needs, the same needs as any other human that's listening to this. People take drastic measures. So you learn how to move in those type of situations, you know, how to make money. And there's more than one way to like, you know, make money. I was 13, had a company called Two Guys in a Rake, me and my cousin, you know, um, <laughs> because, I, you know, before I do crime, I'll mow your lawn, <laughs> break up all these damn leaves for like $20. <laughs> I grew up being shot at. Uh, I'm not, you know, I never was gang affiliated or anything, but it's just like being in the proximity or like my, you know, the people I know might be in gangs or like, you know, they're good people. They just happen to be in these situations, you know. It's, it's funny because you keep saying, you know, uh, just as a, as a figure of speech, but uh, but I'm like, no, I don't know at all. You know, like having never experienced hunger, like growing up in a home where I was expected to get straight A's, like expected to be at school every single day. Yeah, you know, I'm like, oh, I, I definitely don't know. It's like a completely different scene that you're describing. And, yeah. and I think it's it's really helpful that you can paint that picture so vividly because I think for a lot of people, and especially for a lot of climbers, they, they just don't know. You know, it's like they're just so far removed from that reality. Well, one thing me and Conrad argue about is because I'm trying to get him to understand that I'm black. I don't have to willingly suffer. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, Conrad's just like... It's been a while. <clears throat> it's time for a suffer fest. You know what I'm saying? And like, I'm like, yo, I've lived a very hard life. I actually try to suffer as least as possible. <laughs> I don't want to. Well, th then why do you choose to take on such big challenges as a climber? You know, it's like if you, if you don't need to suffer, if you've had enough suffering in your life already, why take on climbing too? <laughs> you know how many come to Jesus moments I've had on the expedition, Alex, <laughs> where I've been like, what am I doing? Why am I doing this? Is it worth it? And the ultimate answer is yes, because so much of my life I've been working to be safe. I've been working to be relaxed. I've been working to get to a point of like, I can exhale, you know? You know, historically, like, you know, black people, we haven't had the time or the equipment to have these type of explorations or like you know going in the backwoods is dangerous if we're going to talk about the animals and the people depending on what part of the country you're in and then once i feel like i'm getting i'm starting to exhale part of me being able to be able to exhale is going to do these dangerous things and um for me to get those experiences and be like no it's beautiful once you hike like 10 12 13 miles it's miserable but when you get to a base camp i swear to god it's worth it and then you know when you get back to base camp you'd be like it wasn't that bad <laughs> it wasn't that's, that a, bad. that's that's the hallmark of a good alpinist is a very short memory you know very bad memory <laughs> it wasn't that bad but until the next storm comes in you like that's why i said i wasn't gonna do this shit that's why okay after the break we talk about memphis rocks's outlook for the future So Memphis Rocks is a modern, beautifully designed gym that stacks up with the best gyms in the country. But it's also an idea about the potential of our sport, not so much in terms of grades or athletic progression. It's about the cultural potential. Right now, we're about two months out from the Olympics. There's a lot of talk about how that will power growth in our sport. There's excitement, but to be frank, there's also a lot of dollar signs in people's eyes. In a lot of ways, Memphis Rocks is like the yin to that yang. It's not that you grow, it's how you grow. Does climbing simply become the domain of the elite? Do we think about the communities where we choose to build our gyms? Memphis Rocks is a good idea, but good ideas aren't guaranteed in business or in life. In fact, Memphis Rocks isn't even the first not-for-profit gym. In 2012, in Greenville, South Carolina, the Mountain Goat opened its doors to the public with the idea that it could foster after-school programs for local kids with the support of the general paying public. Today, the Mountain Goat no longer exists as a climbing gym. For an idea or model like this to thrive, it requires investing real money with no expectation of financial benefit. But what we have to gain, collectively, as a sport, can't really be measured in dollars. So 
so pretty much any climbing gym in the world that I go into, I feel like I'm at home and I feel like I'm entering a, a friendly space. And I think that's mostly because I grew up going to the climbing gym and, and I've always just loved climbing indoors. I love gyms, but it definitely feels like there's this sense of, of climbing community and, and, and sort of home uh, all around the world. And I'm curious what you guys think about that that sensation, that feeling, and, and how that feels at Memphis Rocks. How does Memphis Rocks fit into that global climbing community? I don't want to get on the point of like, oh, you feel at home in every gym because you're a white dude. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's an easy answer or like an easy gimmick or pick. I just think, you know, you growing up in the world of climbing and being like an exceptional climber since teens or smaller and being, you know, brought into the world, you know, climbing world with your father, that it is like home for you, you know. But the thing about being black is like, you're a minority. As a minority, I cannot ever leave my house and be like, oh, I hope I don't see any white people today or like have a racist or oppressive structure. Like white people can literally live their lives where there are no black people. You know what I'm saying? Like you can go to your own church, no black people, school, no black people, grocery store, no black people, neighbors, ain't no black people. And um, it can create a world of like, you know, shock or like... If, you know, when you walk into Memphis Rocks, it's the reverse of like, damn, I've never seen so many black climbers before, you know. But it, like as a minority, um, when I go into gyms, it's just normal. Basically, I said all to say it just feels normal. Like, you know, I'm the black dude, you know. The only difference now is that people aren't scared of me. They know I'm a leak and be all friendly now. <laughs> I'm not I'm not worried about a climbing Karen or anything like that. <laughs> John, you've worked in the climbing gym world for a while. Do you, do you have thoughts on that? Everybody has a different life experience. And I agree, like, you know, let's go back to the early 2000s. Yeah, any gym you walked in, you felt that. You felt that communal and acceptance, even if you weren't from that area. Um, But I think that's changed. And, And this is all this is all my personal opinion. This is not the opinion of Memphis Rocks. When I go into another gym, I don't I don't normally feel that anymore. And I think and Alex, like, correct me if I'm wrong, but, you know, like, I think that with your status in the industry, yeah, people are going to treat you a lot differently than they're going to treat me or they're going to treat Malik when we come into their gym. By 2008, 2009, when the gym started getting a lot bigger, I think that the industry became more about money than it did about community. And gyms sell this sense of community, but they don't really do anything about it. They take the money. And they try to build another 40,000 square foot gym instead of investing in the community that they had right there. So, so what do you think it would take for a climbing, for climbing gyms to feel like home for you? I mean, I think I just need to keep doing what we're doing, like being on this podcast, being more of a representative in the climbing world. And I feel that the more exposure that I have, the more that, you know, recognizable I am to people because usually all I do is try not to feel like I'm threatening people, you know, because I'm a black man, check, scary. I have wild hair, very scary. You know what I mean? (laughs) My beard is to my chest, extremely scary. But I just feel like, you know, I feel safer with the more recognizable I am in the climate world around people. They won't take me as a threat off prima facie or just face value when they look at me. John, obviously between the film Black Ice reaching a lot of the climbing community and the the wave of protests of Black Lives Matter this summer and and a lot of the um, soul searching that's that's occurred in a lot of like white America, I imagine there's been an outpouring of support from the industry. Um, I've been around the industry for a long time and I'll say it bluntly, but the outdoor industry can have a pretty short attention span and it can kind of feel like a company checks a box and then it moves on. Um... And I'm curious whether you worry about that support still being there two or three years from now. Prior to the social justice movement in, in 2020, the companies, the suppliers, um, I, I just I'm, I don't want to say any names of, of companies right now, but, um, you know, I, I would reach out to them and ask for support. And the conversation was always like, yeah, we don't give people money, but, you know, I can give you some gear. And that's cool because, you know, that helps us like build up our, our inventory of, of things that we need when we take, um, take some of these kids outside climbing. But it didn't pay the light bill and it didn't pay payroll. And then 
Once 2020 hit, that's when the industry finally started realizing that that gear is not going to help us. We need operational funds. So by the fall of 2020, I was able to get like a significant significant donations from from some re- really cool really cool brands that uh, that stepped up. And then once Black Ice hit, that's when the sustaining donors, like the climbers themselves, really started stepping up and contributing. So like it's the best financial situation we've ever been in. And we're like more than appreciative. Like we love our donors, but we still have a long way to go because what we do is not cheap. You know, service costs money. And yes, to answer your question, I'm always concerned that like what does it look like a year from now? Will the attention span go somewhere else? And I hope it doesn't. And I think that like having conversations like this, um, we, we just can't stop them. We have to push and we have to push harder because there's still a lot of learning that this industry needs to do. What do you mean by that? What, what kind of learning does this industry need to do? I think that more people of color need to be included in conversations and employed in climbing gyms. And like, if you truly want to be inclusive and and really practice DEI like you you can't still have like this leadership of nothing but white males it nothing's going to change until until you diversify your your management and your your staff do you think that any of the the principles from Memphis Rocks have been adopted by other gyms or like the the concept of a not for profit gym have you seen that replicated anywhere else well, they're definitely spreading. I personally have two to three phone calls or meetings almost every week from folks reaching out that like have heard about us or love what we're doing and they want to they want to build a gym with a similar model and they want to just know how you, how do you do it. And I, I would say the majority of the conversations are from a non-existent company, right? So there's there's a few uh, gyms that have been open and operating that that get involved in that conversation, but 90% are people who are inspired and want to build. We started this podcast because we were exploring how climbing is evolving as it, as it's going through this this sort of crazy transition as it goes to the Olympics and things. And so, on a broad level, how do you guys each want to see climbing evolve and grow? We want to open this gym in other cities because, I mean, God knows every city has underserved communities that that would love something like this. So getting more more people involved, more funding, more facilities and all of that will create more jobs in underserved communities that need the jobs. Malik, how about you? Me personally, I just want to see more representation in climbing on a professional level and just on a micro local level and you know the more representation you have that means the more kids believe that they can do it or know of the sport or see themselves doing that sport and i just want to see it spread and like you know my goal personally with my position in the climate industry is to get as many of my peers and people outside as possible you know i plan on traveling the country and you know linking up with black people across the nation and getting them into the woods uh, into some some capacity. And I want to break down those barriers that, like, black people don't do this. Because, like, I'm from the hood. Like, you know what I'm saying? I'm not, like, uh, I lived in the suburbs type black dude my whole life. Like, I'm from the hood, still in the hood. And um, I go climb mountains, you know. And I'm a shining light to everybody in my community back home. Like, you know, as a person, you know, I live most of my life feeling like I didn't matter. So to be in a position where people are writing me and telling me that like, you know, you let me know I could do this. There one, there was a message with black eyes, a black guy wrote me and he said, um, his whole life, he tried to grow his hair out. Um, he was like the only black kid in his school. And he said, every time he grew his hair out, he felt like he didn't fit in or like, you know, he wasn't looking good enough. So he cut his hair. And after watching black eyes, um, he went and got his hair dreadlocked for the first time. And it's just like those type of impacts that I, you know, I never thought about how that could impact someone's uh, self-esteem when it comes to how they want to present themselves physically. I have multiple moments like that, but just like in those moments, those are the type of things that make me tear up. Malik, do you have any climbing goals for next year? 
Climbing goals for the next year, we are in the process of trying to put together the first full black summit team to go take on Everest. And that is the huge goal. You know, that's like my climbing precipice. Once I do Everest, like, don't ever ask me what I have planned because it'll be like my local crag. It won't be anything serious. <laughs> that's cool. So it's just stuff like that. Just trying to plan, like, you know, my photographer things that I'm going to be doing. I'm probably going to profile everyone at base camp, like have a photograph and a mini story about, like, why the hell are you here type situation. So <laughs> I'm, I'm sure you'll be wondering the same thing. Why the hell am I here? <laughs> after after a couple of weeks of, like, feeling sick in base camp, shooting photos of people, you'll be like... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'll be calling you Alex and be like, why am I here? Tell me something to make me understand why. <laughs> yeah, exactly. To find out how you can support Memphis Rocks, please visit memphisrocks.com. Dot org. That's R-O-X. Thanks to John and Malik for sharing your stories and perspectives. For pictures from today's show, follow us on Instagram at Climbing Gold. The show is a production of Duct Tape Then Beer. Alex Honnold is our host. Today's episode was written and edited by Elizabeth Nicano and me, Fitzka Hall. Additional editing and mixing by Cordelia Zars, who also chipped in on the music. Additional tracks by Brennan O'Connell. Art direction by Anya Miller. Our executive producers for Duct Tape Then Beer are Lisey Hendricks and Becca Cahal. For RxR Sports, Ben Endy and Jonathan Restick. Thanks for listening. <laughs>